And that could be something as simple as running some, like donut shops, manufacturing processes here in Richmond, or it could be in Silicon Valley creating the next technology that Steve Jobs is not aware of, was not aware of, sorry. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you think about that, you know, they, the interesting thing is the uh, academicians have been doing studies and the number of college graduates, you know, uh, computer science as a share has been remaining flat, which really gives you a great opportunity. If you're here and you're making it through, please keep going. We need more people like you, okay? In theory, we don't really need bigger and better coders and designers and database developers. We, we don't really need more of them, we need better of them. And at, at this point, you're on that run rate. You're in that path. Keep going, please. We need talented people in the workforce. So when I mentioned that delicate balance, you know, if, if you think back to the first time that, you know, whether you heard it, whether you ran into it or not, whether you self-discovered, when you found out the power of the for loop, like, mind blown, like, especially if you, like, figured it out on your own, that's powerful. And then, fast forward, you get to algorithms, what do we talk about? Well, shit, man, algorithms are expensive, okay? Slow that, slow your roll. So, and then you have other things in, in algorithms, like graph, uh, graph problems where you learn the connection between things. And then you have other classes in your curriculum. You're going to be getting to uh, database, database systems. How does that work with if you, if you over-engineer the front-end development side as far as the data capture for the back-end who's doing analytics versus if you over-engineer or over, I'll say, hyper-create uh, your system to be aware for the back-end, does that really meet your front-end SLA? So being, being really, when I say you know, that delicate balance, having that true understanding of the problem, because you have a great skill set, but when you get out to the workforce, there's gotta be the right work, forces pulling on you to do it the right way, or this way, or the newest technological way. And your job is to separate all that BS and create the best product you can. So, in terms of being able to do that, and doing that at work, um, you know, how can you get involved before you make it out to the workforce? I think, um, please don't wait for, until you get to senior design to try some things out, right? So obviously you'll have some really good assignments that will challenge you in some ways, but you have, obviously you're part of this, yay, keep going, ramp it up, uh, ramp hacks. Uh, also, don't forget about things like uh, the VIP, Vertical Integrated Projects, it's an excellent way to get really immersed in projects here at VCU. Um, things like the, you know, the, the autonomous vehicles, where I know that there are flight plans, I believe we have autonomous submarine vehicles, perhaps. I know that uh, in the deep learning class, we had a couple of mechanical engineers that were using the algorithms to determine uh, relational distances for, um, again, things underwater. And then, um, you know, there are a number of research opportunities here. If you can, as an undergraduate, learn some research skills, learning how to chunk your papers, how to look at what, if you're solving a problem, what are the algorithms out there that can help you, right? So having, to be, having an understanding, being able to read through that, distill that information, and write, again, write the best code, create the best kind of solution for whatever problem you're solving. So in terms of that and making that, that jump to work, now I'm going to turn it over to Megan, and she's going to talk about what these things work like at work. Hey, Eric. Hey. Technology is a little older than this. I can't even close my laptop. I have a VGA port. Okay, so, all right. Um, okay, so you guys are here to hear a little bit about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, some big words. Hold up your hands if you've ever had a course or you plan on taking a class that uses any of these words in the description. All right, pretty cool. All right, all right so. Hopefully this isn't all brand new for you guys. So a little bit about me, so you understand where I'm coming from in this talk. Uh, I graduated from UVA with a degree in computer science in 2015. Uh, I've been a general employee ever since. They got me in the internship and they haven't let me go yet. Uh, so I was an intern from 2014 to 2015. I was one of these fancy IT development program members that Ryan just tried to pitch to you guys, uh, where I was exposed to our mobile development team at the time. I got to create my own app from scratch. I then worked on an internal team creating a web development uh, website internally for the team. And then I've been with Matt Thompson leading a design ever since. I spent a year as a data analyst. And then he got me 
full time and I've been doing my thing ever since. So it just goes to show you don't have to have a master's degree to do this. You can learn on the job if you're willing, persistent, and have a great teacher. So from that, when I got my degree, I often say I have a degree in Google because as I'm sure you are all very aware, the first thing you probably do is go to Google. How do I do this? What does this code do? Why isn't it code breaking? Who's that person in my class? Who's my professor? What do they actually know? I Googled artificial intelligence. I was like, they want me to talk about this. What are they gonna see? If you go to Google Images, you see a lot of common things. You see the color blue, you see a brain, you see some cogs, you see some circuits, you see some binary code. Not very helpful. So IBM actually was tasked with having AI generate a portrait of what AI thought it looked like. It drew this photo. And this is really how I would describe artificial intelligence to somebody anyway. It's helping each other. You help the machine learn, and the machine helps you with some kind of task. And with that, let's jump in. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, it's pretty damn simple. So artificial intelligence is the broader concept of incorporating human intelligence into a machine. This is any technique which enables computers to mimic human behavior. This is so general. This is simply creating a if-else statement. You're telling a computer, if this, pick that. that. That's considered artificial intelligence in some, some realms. A level deeper, machine learning. This is actually a specific method of training models so they can learn how to make decisions. You are enabling machines to improve any task with more experience. It learns and it comes up with some input. A level deeper is your deep learning. This is your, your hot topic. These are your artificial neural networks. These are is things, some classes of uh, natural language process involved in deep learning. Uh, so again, algorithms that are inspired how the human brain processes information, artificial neural networks. So, how are these tools used in the wild? What are some of these techniques? What do I do every day as a machine, as a data scientist? How do I use machine learning in the insurance industry? Well, because I don't know how many of you guys just came from the free food and how many of you actually want to learn, we're going to start with some basic definitions you can walk away with. Uh, I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to talk about some features and covariates. So, these are the inputs to any kind of model you build. These are your independent variables. So, you think of your basic equation, y equals mx plus b. These are your x's. Next up is your target. This is what your model is trying to predict. So this again would be the y in your y equals mx plus b. Regression models are just classification models. So a regression model is very simply, is a model that takes, that creates an output of some continuous variables. Let's say you're trying to predict the housing price on a house you like 10 years from now. That would be a regression model. Classification models have it right in the name, it's a little bit cheating, class. It's helping you identify a class. You're trying to determine whether that email is spam or not. Is your class of spam or not spam? That's simply a classification model. And now finally, the last two big ones, supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. So these are kind of schools that your machine models would fall into. Uh, some would say there's a third one. There is, we're not getting into that right now. So your supervised learning is going to be applied when you have that target class. You have a data set that has spam and not spam emails. You have a data set that has fraud and not fraud. You're going to be using supervised learning models in order to classify or regress or come up with some output. Now your unsupervised learning is when you don't have a target, you don't have a labeled data set, you're just trying to understand something about this big set of data you've been given. You're trying to understand the underlying structure of your data. You don't really know what you're going to get out. You're hoping it tells you that persons A, B, and C look like B, B, and F. You don't know why. These people look together. They're clustered. So let's jump into decision trees. So decision trees are kind of like your bread and butter. They're probably the first thing you're gonna start with in a machine learning class or any kind of machine learning course you're taking online. They're gonna talk about decision trees. So they're used for both classification and regression problems. They, uh, it's a tree-based method, as the name states, and it behaves with if-else conditions leading to a specific result. And it's built on an entire data set using all features and variables of interest. So as you can see in the example up here, there appear to be three features, your age, where they eat lots of pizza. This is really just a, a coincidence. I didn't pick this on purpose, actually. Uh, you eat a lot of pizza and you exercise in the morning. So as you can see, the model just simply takes these three features and spits it out the tree so you can follow down. What are great about these? They are super easy to interpret. You can take a decision tree to any person in the business side when we're building models for them and say, this is what the model spit out. This is why someone was considered fraudulent. This is why this model came up with this output. You can follow the tree. It's super easy to explain. Um, and it can handle both numerical and categorical data. And it performs well in large data sets. What are some challenges? Well, if you take an algorithm, as you can probably see that it's a Groovy algorithm. It's a Groovy model, meaning that it makes the most optimal decision at each step, but doesn't really consider 
uh, the global optimum. And uh, so therefore it's prone to overfitting. Uh, so what's the next step then? You use decision three, you can take them to the business. Where would you go next? Maybe go to rainforest next. Still a bread and butter algorithm, still one you're gonna try next, because uh, most decision trees aren't going to answer the questions that we bring up in the insurance industry. So a random forest is actually a collection of decision trees whose results are aggregated into one final result. Uh, so if you were to look at each one of these little tree situations happening over here, and they were trying to predict whether you were a healthy person or not, maybe that first cluster of trees used your weight baby height. Maybe the next one looked like that guy. And then maybe the third one had some other variables and some other classifications. They would then follow down each of these trees and then come up with a final result. So great. Kind of helps with the overfitting. You can have as many trees, you can give it 100 variables and each tree could be maybe 10, so then you're kind of helping yourself out, figuring out which variables are the most important ones. What's the problem here? Well, if I have a random forest that has 300 trees in it, how do I show Joe Schmo over in business what my machine is doing, what my model is doing? I can't really just print out 300 trees and say, well, because that one case you were questioning about had this result over these 300 trees, no, you're not going to do that. It's going to waste everyone's time. So it's a black box. It's not as easy to interpret. But it is, it's not greedy. It's not as greedy. It's, a, it's less prone to overfitting, and it's a little more robust. So those are the pros. They kind of outweigh them. They typically go hand in hand decision trees and random forests. If you're going to build one, you're typically going to build the other. Typically, the random forest will outperform the decision tree. But the decision tree is, as we saw, easier to interpret to people who aren't as tech savvy as the people in this room right now. So what if industry use cases for these two guys? Uh, well, you can use them for identifying fraudulent transactions with banking, uh, customer targeted marketing, and uh, car and home pricing. Uh, but as you'll see, you can pretty much do this with any model about to talk about. And uh, they're great because they need a minimal amount of data. You only need a few thousand uh, data points as opposed to something bigger like a neural network we're about to get into, which needs probably tens of thousands of data points. And uh, yeah, they're really user friendly. They're really easy to start and get off the ground. There's not a lot of user input. You can find code out there for your language of choice saying, how do I create a rainforest? How do I create a decision tree? They're very user friendly. So next up, which is probably what you all came here for when you saw decision or data science or AI or ML or deep learning, these are your artificial neural networks. So they can be used to cluster and classify data, meaning they can be used for both supervised and unsupervised problems. And uh, they are really the start of deep learning. They are what inspired deep learning, and then deep learning has grown past it. So that's why you see deep learning on the graph and not just neural networks, because it's become its own thing now. Uh, but so they are brain-inspired systems, which are intended to replicate the way humans learn. So you have your input layer, and then you have a hidden layer, which then acts on those. So if we were to use our like the uh, are you fit exercise, maybe one of those input layer nodes was your your uh, age and then whether you eat when you exercise, and you have this in this case two hidden layers which does something to those inputs and then spits out the final output of yes or no, are you are you uh, fit? Um, so there are many different types of artificial neural networks. That could be a topic and a class and it probably is that a class that we can do? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a class in and of itself. So I'm not a master of them, I'm not gonna teach you that. I'm just here to help you guys walk away with some kind of knowledge so we can talk about this. Uh, yeah, so many different types of uh, neural networks, and they all have their own level of complexity and specific use cases, as I'm sure some of you know, and can probably talk about. It's not my job here today. Uh, and they excel at finding complex patterns that may be too time consuming and beyond the capabilities of a human. Some cons, they themselves are time consuming to run. They also need many, many, many pieces of data. About at least a thousand data points for each of the classes that you're trying to predict. So, if you're trying to predict fraud, you need a thousand data points, at least a thousand data points of fraud, and at least a thousand data points of not fraud to compare to. Even that's very prone to overfitting. You're going to want a lot more data than that. Uh, and again, it's even more so a black box than your tree based ones. At least the random forest ones, I can kind of explain to someone who's not technical what's happening here. With this one, you really, they just have to trust you. They just have to say, Unless you have a business partner who also has a computer science degree, they're not going to believe you really when you tell them about this. So you have to have a lot of trust with the person you're building for uh, when you use things like this. But what are some use cases? Facial recognition. 
big one, big thing. Uh, next we've got handwriting recognition, any kind of recognition really. So we, we normally take images and uh, like recordings, sound recordings. Uh, they have been used to automate insurance underwriting, not at our company, but at other companies. That'd be a lot of fun to try and convince uh, the lawyers to let us do. Uh, they can be used in a piece of content detection, identifying fraudulent transactions in banking. Again, you'll see a lot of overlap between here and your decision tree that you're in for us. That's because they can answer the same questions, but you need lots of data for a neural network. And in a lot of cases today, some of these companies don't have thousands upon thousands of clean data points to model on. So that's why these aren't always used in today's world, in our types of industries. Now your Googles, your Ubers, your really big Amazons, they probably are using neural networks because how many users per day do they have? How many data points? How many years have they been doing this? How many of them started as data-centric companies? So that's really what we're pushing for at Genlist too, is to become more data-driven. They say, oh, well, we're collecting that information. Can we also collect A, B, and C about that person? Or D, E, and F? So, Anyway, back to this. Uh, so, neural networks in the industry. Actually, this is what was created. I don't know if you guys remember many years ago, Target got them in some hot water uh, in that they were using, they had just started their whole loyalty program where they were recording what you were buying, and they started sending um, new mom welcome kits to uh, women who had been buying certain things before they knew they were pregnant because they predicted it with their, with their data points because they had so many of them. So an area where you can get into some hot water and where marketing should probably step in and say, let's, uh, let's notice what's, what not to do here, really. <laughs> and then uh, the last technical area I'm gonna talk about, and I say this the last, because it kind of, it kind of overarches everything. So neural, uh, natural language processing can be as simple as an artificial network definition, or sorry, artificial intelligence definition, and some of the models can get as complex as deep learning specific. So natural language processing. This is the art and science that helps to extract information from text and use it in computations and algorithms. AKA, it enables a machine to read, if you will. Uh, so these, like I said, can range from super simple, simply counting the number of times a word is in a sentence, uh, to something as uncovering structure and text and meaning, and again, that whole spam versus not spam, maybe on an unlabeled uh, data set determining if something's spam based on sentiment analysis. Uh, challenges. Uh, language is tricky. There's more than one language. Nowadays, there's many languages. There's double meaning. There's typos. None of us are perfect. There's several ways. I mean, in today's world, NP, no problem, LOL, laugh out loud, PC, PC, you can go on and on. And uh, yeah, so where can it be used? It's actually being used in disease prediction using health records and customer Holland information, which I thought was super fascinating and also with consumer opinion when they can scrape social media and see what people are talking about on specific products, sentiment analysis. Uh, email classification, spam filters. Again, spam filters, a lot of different types of machine learning models can be applied to that problem. And voice-driven interfaces with your Alexa and your Siri and all those good things. Uh, so last but certainly not least is your real-world headaches. So I just spent 15, 20 minutes talking to you about all these plant fancy models that you can use. Uh, but what actually do I spend most of my time on as a data scientist? It's your real world headaches. It's your missing data, which is a field in of itself. What happens if you have Joe Schmo who has a perfect amount of data but is missing an age? What age is very critical to my model? What do I do? What do I do when I have a problem where the target class that he's using is trying to predict is super small? and Joe Schmo is missing his age, and he's a perfect candidate for that. Do I fill it in? Do I remove him? It's a whole industry into itself. It's a whole field into itself. Imbalance problems. Again, I'm picking on fraud. Let's talk about fraud as a big one. Fraud, in most cases, probably happens at big industries, depending on the industry, 1% of the time. I make a model, accuracy is 99% accurate. Business people, great, you can predict fraud 99% of the time. Fraud is a 1% problem. If I just always predict that it's never fraud, I'm right 99% of the time. Right there, pretty easy. So how do you talk through that with people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Take a problem like that for any project and say you're right 99% of the time. You won't be wrong. They just won't understand. Uh, <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> Sample sizes. So again, we talked about uh, what if you really want to use a neural network? What if a neural network only thing that can solve your problem. 
but you don't have enough samples to use one. Uh, again, this is another area into itself, which you can, you can get a PhD and know all the things that you can do. The sample sizes, do you uh, use a different model because unfortunately you don't have samples? Do you upsample? Do you oversample, over undersample? Do you boost? Uh, let's say you have 43 samples and you come up with 200 features. Well, you can't use all those features. You could use maybe four. So again, these are your problems. This is a big problem. And data purity, especially in the real world. If you take any type of machine learning class, or you know AI, or deep learning class in college, you are probably, I can't speak to DC, but I'm gonna assume, you're given a very nice, pure data set. Very few things are wrong with it. In the real world, we could have three fields for first date, and none of them could be the same, and all of them could be wrong. <laughs> that is a real issue across many fields, okay? That's a day-to-day -day issue. So with all that in mind, this is a breakdown of how I spend a typical week as a data scientist at a Fortune 500 insurance company. I spend, so again, let's say on average 40 hours, it's 40 hours per week, give or take, we're not factoring in lunch or holidays or anything like that. I spend about 25 hours a week on data pre-processing. This is pulling data out of SQL, this is validating my data, this is cleaning it, this is dealing with null values, this is going to Matt and being like, why was this first person born in the 1800s? What's going on here? I then spend maybe five hours a week on a good week doing all these fun techniques I just talked to you guys about. Five hours of my week. Because I could build the best model in the world, but if I don't have the correct birth date from that system, no one's going to use it. Period. End of story. That's all you need to know, really. And then the last ten, the last few hours of my week are spent what I'm going to call peopling. So who here loves group projects? <laughs> it's okay, there are people out there. You're gonna make a great project manager probably. If you if you love group projects and you love working with people, no, actually you're gonna probably do really great. I thought I loved group projects. And then I got to the real world where nobody wants to do the work and everyone's gonna get assigned something, and you're gonna have to have the big meeting, i.e. we have a three hour meeting tomorrow. I had to have a one and a half hour meeting today to prep for it, in addition to an hour meeting I had two weeks ago to prep for it. On addition to the fact that I was on vacation last week and had to spend two hours of my vacation working on the things that the meeting today is going to be tomorrow. Keep on, okay? This is, the, this is the world, okay? This is the workforce. No one tells you about. You're going to spend a chunk of your week peopling. And uh, because I'm a data person, I wanted to break this out because obviously with the data pipeline, the data process, I don't spend every week like this. So let's say I do it in months. Let's chunk it out. Of the year, I subtracted holidays. I subtracted personal time. I did all of that. In an average 12 month year, I spend 6.7 months in that yellow pre-processing zone. I spend over half my year just processing data, pulling it, cleaning it, validating it. I spend almost one and a half months just talking to people. Just talking to people, all right? And then I spend 2.7 months doing all that fun stuff I just told you about. That's 2.7 months where I have to teach myself how they work, teach other people how they work, get them to trust that I know what I'm talking about, and then also build these things, get the code to work, and pull all the right data in correctly. That's that, okay? You guys are gonna sit in the course about it, you're gonna get really excited about it. Just also know the patience that's gonna have to go in to doing this work. It's really worth it, it's a lot of fun, and you get to give talks like this and impress everyone with neural networks, and then look at their faces when they realize how much work has to go in behind the scenes before you can get to that fun model. So with that, are there any questions? Uh. So when you started off, yeah. what were the classic mistakes you realized now when it came to the data pre-processing that it's like, don't do that? Um, I came at this from a very interesting perspective because I never thought I'd be a data scientist. I thought I was going to be a mobile developer. I thought I was going to be a software developer. That's what I was trained to do at UVA Computer Science. Uh, it wasn't until I started working with Matt as a data analyst, if you will, during my rotations that I realized there's a lot more to this. I had a natural skill with SQL. But something that I will give to all of you is to talk to people who know more than you. I thought I could figure it out all on my own. I was like, I'm an expert at this. I can write the best SQL queries. The SQL queries that people over here are writing are so inefficient. Well, my name, they've been working in this industry for many, many years, and they understand why the SQL, while it looks inefficient, has to be written that way. Uh, so my advice to you for data pre-processing and for everything is to not to try to invent the wheel, just talk to people who know more than you, because they will give you. Someone who probably not as smart as you built the database. Yes. 
And we'll put date as a text. Yeah. And we'll put zip code in as a number. Anyway, anything? What classes like in college did you take that or like you think like prepared you or help you to like for uh, what you are now? Sure, yeah. So like I said, I came at this from an odd perspective, thinking I would be a mobile developer or a software developer. Uh, but databases was a big one for me, understanding how databases work when I'm pulling this information, just having an understanding of I've never seen this database before, I'm gonna have to pull this data in from my model. So understanding how a database works, and like when you have that understanding, you can pretty much go into any database today and be like, okay, I know these IDs are gonna match, I know because of hierarchy, this is how this is gonna work. Past that, my algorithm classes, any of my thinking thinking classes where you really had to think more than you had to code, at least if you were smart, you thought more than you coded. And those have really helped me in the challenges of not knowing. Matt saying, go over here and build this type of model, and then I now have to learn. I have to go Google, learn, I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel. Someone's probably already coded this, going to find it, and then pulling it apart and putting it back together how I needed it. So those kind of courses really helped me. Any more? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How do you sanitize the data for the most part? I know you said that there's a lot of just manual combing through it, but there's no way you can comb through all of these. So sure. So, um, Matt, I'll let you take this one. He loves this yeah. area. <laughs> so it really comes down to, um, from, I learned this about 10 years from a, there's a field called measure theory, it's a branch of statistics that talks about how is a variable supposed to be treated. So there are like data types. And once you start thinking about data types and then realizing how many ways someone could screw that data type up. Like I gave the example of dates, I'm not joking. We have some databases that date <laughs> is a string, some bases, some it's a number of some type, or a true date representation. And in the same database across different tables, they're different things, because they were built with different years by different people. Yeah, and then and then be able to be able to write programs that be able can in a sense sense is this field this type of data that I'm expecting. Um, I, I, and she can give you examples. We we literally will hit the same database, and it may this, the field we need may be named similarly in three different fields. And that's that's always a joy. So you have to have some sense of like, well, how are the data distributed? So I have a really strong statistics background. So understanding how data are distributed, being able to reproduce what the data is from a distribution standpoint, what it should be, um, really. A more concrete example. Uh, sometimes it's because of the case where it's not going to impact our data, it's very, very small, we might remove them. For instance, we're working on a model right now. If the person doesn't have an age or a marital status or a birthday, if they have no information, we just wipe them because the impact is so tiny, it's not worth it. Now, in some cases, when we're trying to model something, maybe we'll fill in the value with a value that's never going to be seen. So let's say, you know, age for the people we're modeling on right, ranges from 40 to 100. And I'm sorry, age is a bad example. Better example. Let's say they don't have a diagnosis and we're trying to do something with diagnosis. And we don't, when we like, we need some kind of indicator saying zero means this diagnosis, one means this diagnosis, two means this diagnosis. If they have no diagnosis in the system, maybe we'll set it to negative one because we know negative one is our way of showing they don't have that information. Because then maybe that will help the model to say, oh, if we're predicting fraud and they don't have a diagnosis in the system, maybe that's kind of fishy and we don't want to lose that system. So that's a more concrete example. It really depends on what you're doing. It always, that's the, that should be the theme of data science. It depends. <laughs> it depends. between everything. Exactly. And, yeah. and pipelining. So in other words, writing your code in a, a, obviously a modular way, but be able to pipeline it such that um, data science is very iterative. I mean, I, when I ask her to build a model, she knows that's not one model. It could be tens, it could be 160,000. So, so the same model a thousand times with one small thing changed every single time. And like as she alluded to, in a meeting just today, we use our best information with no, with no, you know, no other, better information so we inferred what a field was. It's not exactly used that way. So now we have to go back and start all over. Pipelining says, okay, send that through my process, and now I don't have to, you know, it's, it's a big efficiency. Other questions? Anything at all? Could you give a, a uh, kind of an example of the random forest neural network? They look really, really similar in the process. Um, so if you think about a random forest, 
the reason it's called a random forest is because it's a decision tree that you add another tree and you make some random splits and cuts. And it, it, I shouldn't say that, it, it is doing a little bit more than that. But the idea is if you add one tree and we know it's greedy and it's gonna overfit, if I put two trees together and I put some random variance in there and I don't let it, every tree see every um, case and I don't let every tree see every variable, will I get a different outcome? So express, so pick that, take that idea up to two, to three, to four, to 20, to a thousand. So if I have a thousand trees, that's gonna get a sense of, okay, 90% of the time, this is a really good variable. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a metric called feature importance, which is basically a measure of how many times does this end up, this feature, this covariate, this variable, end up correctly predicting the outcome. So you can get a sense of like, I, I can't tell you from a magnitude perspective, like a statistical model, but I can tell you from a machine learning model, this is very important. So that is, in a sense, from an, uh, a random forest perspective. Um, there be dragons when you start talking about neural networks and deep learning, because that's when you have, you're making all these connections and it really, what, 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 Because um, when we talk about artificial neural networks, you know, there's, there's the basic, like, you know, we're talking about the multi-layer perceptron, so you have those types, and then you can go on to the neural, deep neural networks which are actually what are called uh, architectures. So the hidden um, components have specific meaning. So when you talk about like image classification, some of these um, in between um, hidden stages are, are learning like things like edges. Some things are learning things like color, or this is a face, this is a nose. So all of those have meaning. That is, you can't get anything like that with a random forest. You can get, oh, this is easily predicted. Uh, whereas with a neural network, or especially a deep neural network, you can get to all of this has meaning behind the prediction. Sorry, what was that? The last, all of this has meaning what? The last one you said there? All of this has meaning behind the prediction. Okay. Yeah, you're still getting the prediction at the end of the neural network, but you're uncovering a lot of, I'll say, feature space. How many uh, data scientists do you guys have at GenWord? Uh, funny enough, Matt is the lead data scientist. We are missing Morgan Stewart, who's currently a PhD student here. He's a senior data scientist, and then there's myself, normal data scientist. Uh, <laughs> it's still a field we're trying to grow, uh, obviously. Uh, Matt uh, Morgan also went through the internship in the IT CT program, if you will, and he found that, they connected, that relationship was born. Uh, and then I came through a couple years later, and I was just like, please take me too, because I like you guys. Uh, and they very begrudgingly took on the little sister of the team and <laughs> taught her everything. Uh, and we are currently have, we typically always have an intern and an IT development program member underneath us trying to find the next best fit. It's gotta be a fit both ways. You guys have to want to work with us, and we have to be able to teach you, and, and it has to be a good relationship, because then you will never leave once you join. Uh, and yeah, so. Always a spot. You guys want hoping to, to grow. grow. We're hoping to grow. Hoping to grow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, and I guess, how much data do you guys usually work with? Like, what? Is... Uh, so I'll go back to the default. It depends. Uh, the problem dependent. The problem dependent. Project I'm currently working on is a model had to have been built on after a lot of the cleaning, all the modeling, the computational, the missing data was removed, all of the things we couldn't use were removed. Thirty-seven hundred samples. 24% of them were my target. And I have to then take that model that was built on that and apply it to correctly from the budget here, 26,000 units afterwards. So I'm building a model on 3,700 pieces of data that has to then predict 26,000. So perfect example right there. Or are there other cases like where we, uh, we have like a half a million people we put through a process where we we build a natural language processing model to predict um, what their occupation was. So in that, we had to use a bunch of data that was, in a sense, unrelated to the underwriting piece. But um, again, half a million people, so. It depends. It depends. Depends on the problem. What is your data storage and processing capacity? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, am I, what am I going to say? I don't know what I'm going to say. Noah. 
Uh, no, no. Uh, okay, so our no. databases that we touch, uh, the downward plots and the mid the ones that we touch um, are green plums uh, that we're pulling our data from. We also have uh, some Hadoop, which is, Storage. Yeah, do you mean like tech stack or do you mean like just I mean like data stores? On the data side, data storage between data systems. Okay, so, well, um, so we have a system that we have our own private server, so it has to be locked down separate from the rest of the company. With that, we make our connections through um, our stack is going to be Jupyter Hub, and we write a lot of Python scripts to get everything from SQL databases, SQL queries. Uh, distributed databases, Spark, Hadoop, Hive. Some other teams are, yeah. are responsible for data storage. We're responsible for getting it out and using it. Yeah, there, we have an entire group of probably 30 people on our what, ETL extract transfer over load team that they do that fun work. she said really goes back to in, in my in my preamble in my talk I was talking about having the ability to do academic research and be able to read through papers because what Morgan did was he found the a person. yeah He's the other here. person yes he uh, there's a technique called SMOTE S-M-O-T-E yeah. synthetic minority over class something yeah anyway um, so but it's it's everything she described is because Morgan read the, a few papers figured out the best way to code it in our environment. So now we all, all have access to using this SMO technique to, um, when, when we run into problems with these kind of models. And the, the current theme amongst the team is like we try to stick to our, I'll say our best strength. So I write, again, I have a really strong back of the metrics and statistics. So I write thing, uh, packages for the group to look at data and how that's distributed and, and then or other types of models and then uh, Megan has a lot of uh, efficiency code and a lot of queries that query other queries and programs that write other programs. So we all. We all have our niches and we all play together. But we're all responsible for our own work, but we're all responsible for each other's work too. Which is the benefit of having small teams. Get lab pub. Get lab pub. <laughs> You said at the beginning you guys are, what, people to apply online? Oh yeah, apply online, talk to us, and we'll get you in.